Welcome. It started a little early today. For those of you who read your email, Jim Bright said we would start at 12 today. I'm already four minutes late. Thank you all so much for being here, both at the Frangie Panty Room and on Zoom. Welcome to all of you on this fine, crisp November day. It's Thanksgiving week. The IMU is quiet, as there are no classes this week, and most students have traveled home to be with their families. But I want to thank those of you who open up your homes every Thanksgiving to international students to share a meal with them. To start our meeting today, let's please observe a silent reflection. Thank you, you can be seated. And here's Owen Johnson to give our reflection. This is Native Americans Month, and I've decided to speak to you as a historian. You've heard the Thanksgiving story many times, I'm sure, how American Indians helped the pilgrims survive and the pilgrims invited them to a celebration of Thanksgiving. At the beginning of the 17th century, there had been between 30,000 and 100,000 members of the Wampanoag Nation living in 69 villages on land that stretched from southeastern Massachusetts to parts of Rhode Island. They lived on a land of plenty, hunting deer, elk, and bear in the forests, fishing for herring and trout, and harvesting quahog, round clams, in the rivers and bays. They planted corn and used fish remains as fertilizer. They had traded and fought with European explorers since 1524. Starting in the decade before the pilgrims arrived, the Wampanoags were nearly wiped out by a mysterious disease, which some historians think was smallpox or possibly yellow fever. By the time the pilgrims arrived, two thirds of the Wampanoags had been killed by the, what they called the great dying. In 1620, half of the pilgrims died from cold, starvation and disease. The actual history of what happened 400 years ago this year bears little resemblance to the story we've been taught. There were no feathered headdresses and initially no effort to invite the natives to the feast. Probably no turkey was served either. The pilgrims were thankful only that they had survived. The Wampanoags showed up only when the pilgrims fired some of their muskets in celebration. When they were told it was a feast, they contributed five deer to add to the fowl, fish, shellfish, and eel. How many of you are having eel for your Thanksgiving dinner? For many Native Americans then, the fourth Thursday in November is a day of mourning not of celebration. While the Wampanoags did help the pilgrims survive, their support was followed by years of a slow unfolding genocide of their people and the taking of their land. So what are we to do? We should remember that this land was their land. IU, as President Sally reminded us several weeks ago, sits on the ancestral lands of the Miami, the Delaware, the Potawatomi, and the Shawnee people. We do not need to give up Thanksgiving celebrations. We certainly should give thanks for the blessings we have received. But let us do away with the pageant celebrating a Thanksgiving history that just like the story of George Washington supposedly 
admitting to cutting down a cherry tree never was. And let us commit to providing the blessings of life, liberty, and the pursuit of freedom to all peoples in this country. Thank you, Owen. So I have thank yous. Um, Dave Meyer sitting up here by himself. He's our producer today. Michael Shermis did show up as 1030 as usual, just in case. Um, thank you to our Zoom manager, Joy Harder, and to our remote and camera, to our remote camera and mic operators, Martha Foster and Aaron Davis. Um, thank you to Owen for that reflection. Thanks to Joy for introducing any Zoom guests that we might have. Thank you to Jim Bright, who's our roundabout reporter. And special thanks to Ashley Wesley, who was up here last week when I had to be out of town. It's really good to be back, but thank you for, be for doing it, Ashley. We have one birthday this coming week, and that is none other than the president of Teachers Warehouse and member of the board of directors of our club, Ron Barnes, on November 26th. There are no member anniversaries this year, but Owen tells me that Marshall and Ann Goss just celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. Now I've got some announcements. You all are so quiet today. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks to everybody who attended the district foundation event here at the IMU last Friday. In addition to us old timers, we had several newer members attend, and so I particularly want to thank Aaron Brewington, Marcus Debro, and Bet Savage for coming. It was great to see you. I always find it gratifying to learn about the good work that has been done all over Southern Indiana by our fellow Rotary Clubs. Um, and that's what happens at district events. So this is an advance shout out for our district conference, which will take place in this very building on Saturday, April the 9th. Make sure you've got it written on your calendar. So some Rotarians in the news. I learned that yesterday, Owen Johnson spoke to the Combined Service Clubs of Indianapolis. He talked about Ernie Pyle. And Owen's not a, not a retired, unbusy person. Last week, Owen got up at the crack of dawn to speak on a panel that was taking place in Moscow, although he was here in Bloomington, the power of Zoom. Other Rotarians in the news, Charlotte and Paul Zitlow. Charlotte, I see you on your beach today. I'm glad that you're there. Charlotte and Paul were the focus of a column in the HT written by Rayleigh Lambert from Brisbane, Australia. Rayleigh wrote about her experience as a Rotary Exchange student with the Zitlows as a 17 year old in 1976. Now, wouldn't we have all loved to have been say a domestic exchange student at the Zitlow's house at some point. I would have loved that. More Rotarians in the news. Congratulations to our thespians, Connie Shakalis for appearing in 2020 COVID the musical at the Brown County Playhouse. And big kudos to Isidore James Torrey, who directed the winning team of actors in the Bloomington Playwrights Project annual Ike and Julie Arnoff playoffs. Congrats, Jimmy. Speaking of theater, I'd like to ask Vaughn Welch to come to the podium. Now, Vaughn, just as a reminder, is our board um, district grant chair. Um, his day job is associate vice president at IU for information security and executive director for cybersecurity innovation. I remember asking him at a rotary meeting once what I should do about my password protection, which I still haven't done. <clears throat> but speaking of the theater, um, Vaughn also is the current board president for the BPP. And just on a, personal night, on a personal note, many of you know that I've dedicated my life and work of my career to creating access to all of the arts for all of the people. Arts organizations in Bloomington, particularly our performing arts groups, dance, music, and theater, were particularly hard hit by the pandemic, devastated by the pandemic but now we're coming back and we'd like to provide a special opportunity for Rotarians to experience live theater. Fun. Uh, 
Uh, thank you so much, Sally, and please do change those passwords. Um, so as Sally mentioned, I'm Vaughn Welch, and I'm here speaking you to you today as the president of the Bloomington Playwrights Project Board. For those of you not familiar with BPP, it is the theater in town dedicated to new works that you have not seen produced anywhere else. And as Sally mentioned, we have our first live show since the start of the pandemic uh, happening in December. This show is just between the all of us, a romantic select your own adventure musical comedy. If you can't find one of those adjectives you like, I'm afraid there's nothing I can do for you. But we're trying to restart people coming back to the theater and hopefully also reconnecting with friends. And so Sally and I saw this as an opportunity to team and we're offering everyone in Rotary a four for one ticket special to the show. So it's an opportunity for you and a partner and some friends to come see the show. It's running throughout December and I'll point you at newplays.org for more information uh, about the show. To take advantage of this, please just call BPP Managing Director Brad Schisser and tell him, uh, well, tell him you're with Vaughn, then after he hangs up, call back and tell him you're with Rotary. And you'll find some of Brad's cards uh, distributed on the tables and Natalie also has a stack of them. And you'll also find on the website various safety precautions. A new ionizing filter, we'll be doing uh, either immunizations or a recent test and then per CDC guidance masks. So thank you very much for considering this. And I will be there on December 8th, opening night and hope to see some of you. Thank you very much. Those BPP folks have really odd senses of humor. So um, that's what that whole thing about Brad and Vaughn calling back was about. Um, I hope to see you there as well. I'm going on December 16th. Now, um, I forgot to introduce our guests. I have a tendency to do this. I need someone to remind me. We have two guests here in the Frangipani today. First, Josh Johnson is a guest of Aaron Brewington. Josh, will you stand up? Great to see you again. MNMW Productions is his business. And Tim, I cannot read the writing, the handwriting of the name of your guest. Bob Bernanke. Welcome, Bob. I got, I got the first name, just not the last name. Please come back. I don't think there are any guests on Zoom today. Is that right, Joy? That is correct, Sally, other than our guest speaker is with us on Zoom. So, yes. Well, there is that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> Another first for Bloomington Rotary. Our speaker today will be coming to us on Zoom. Yes. Okay. Um, I've got a few more important announcements, which is partially why we started so early today. In the spirit of Thanksgiving, I want to share some notes of gratitude that we received recently as a club. First, from Pantry 279, which was the first quarter recipient of our speaker recognition program. That's when we draw the name of a local nonprofit out of a hat and then give them a small gift at the end of the quarter. So... From Juanita Hoffman, the Assistant Director of Pantry 279, thank you for supporting us as we continue to try to help those in need. It is our mission to help anyone who contacts us to find food, hope, and help that they need. This is another challenging year for our Thanksgiving baskets. We provide the items for preparation for a complete Thanksgiving Day celebration. Thank you Rotarians for your efforts in helping provide help to others. She goes on to say that they're searching for a new location. I'm assuming in Ellettsville, although I'm not uh, sure about that. If any of us have clues to a place that they can um, move their services, please let them know. So first that small gifts, it's $100. Small gifts mm -hmm. go a long way to local groups. Second, this is really big. I have thank you letters in hand from the three recipients of our annual Ivy Tech Bloomington Scholarship Program. Our club awards three $500 scholarships at Ivy Tech Bloomington's campus each year, all in the fall term. 
Recipients are selected by an internal Ivy Tech committee, which includes representation from financial aid, academic affairs, and student development. An eligible candidate must have a cumulative GPA of 3.0 or greater, be enrolled as a full-time student at Ivy Tech Bloomington, have a current FAFSA on file with the Office of Financial Aid, therefore we know that there is financial need, have completed at least 12 credit hours in their chosen academic program, complete a 750 word essay addressing their careers, uh, their career aspirations, graduation plans, and involvement in any civic engagement, and of course obtain a letter of recommendation from a faculty member in their academic program. So these letters are amazing. I wish the students were here themselves to thank us. That's been a little bit challenging for them for the last couple of years. So that's why we've got their thank you letters instead. The first one is from Rafael Ramirez. Thank you for the very generous scholarship of $500. I am a general studies major right now at Ivy Tech, but I plan to transfer to Indiana University and major in economics and mathematics with an emphasis in econ law. I'm currently a sophomore with 18 credit hours this semester and 21 credit hours next semester to conclude my studies at Ivy Tech, graduate, and then transfer to IU. Thank you to this general scholarship I received. Thanks to this general scholarship I received. I'm one step closer to achieving my goal by removing some of the financial burden and allowing me to focus on stuff that is more important, like school. My goal is to one day help students with a big financial burden help achieve their dreams of higher education and seeking improvement. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, Rafael Ramirez. Our other two, um, I believe are both enrolled in the nursing program. First, we have Laura Beth Wayne, Dear Bloomington Rotary Club, thank you so much for the scholarship. I was happy and appreciative to learn that I was selected. I am just beginning my journey into a second career in nursing. I was a teacher for 15 years and switching careers has been a leap of faith. I am excited to be going back to school at Ivy Tech where I truly believe I will be supported throughout the next few years as I become a nurse. I'm a mother of two younger children and have eliminated my income to go back to school. The scholarship will help me greatly to pay for school. The scholarship will allow me to focus on my education and get started on my new career and educational path. I appreciate the scholarship deeply. I commit to working hard and being a strong and committed student. Your generosity will not be forgotten. That's Laura Beth Wayne of Bloomington. And finally, we have Carrie Biddle of Bloomington. Dear Bloomington Rotary, thank you so much. I am extremely grateful and humbled to be a recipient of your scholarship. I am currently in my third semester in the ASN program at Ivy Tech Bloomington. When I started my journey at Ivy Tech, I wasn't sure that I was capable of succeeding, and to be honest, it was scary. I have watched myself succeed more than I thought possible. I am on track to graduate May 2022, and am now looking at transferring after graduation in order to attain my bachelor's in nursing. I have not only shown myself that I am beyond capable of succeeding, but I've also shown my children that hard work pays off. Without your generosity, I would not be able to support my family while also attending school. It has reduced my stress level, knowing that I am able to better provide for both myself and children while focusing on my academic responsibilities. I'm so grateful for the generosity shown to me through scholarships that I have been inspired to help others in such ways as peer mentorships. I've been shown that higher education is always achievable and I'm forever thankful for the tremendous support from my community. Thank you. That's Carrie Biddle. So that's our three scholarship recipients from Ivy Tech Bloomington for this year. Wow. We have a couple of minutes for happy dollars. If anyone's happy and or just wishing to express gratitude as these students have done and as I have tried to do today. Please wait for Martha and Aaron, our dynamic duo. If you're here in the frangipani, does anyone on Zoom want to express your happiness or gratitude to support Teachers Warehouse? There is cash involved. Yes, I am in very happy for the occasion of Thanksgiving 
as well as the family gathering since my daughter and her family coming to spend a few days with us. And very, very happy to let the crowd know that my granddaughter has been accepted to the Kelly School of Business for the coming year. So I'm delighted for all the above. I'll give $20 to the teacher warehouse. Thank you, Raj. And we hope that your daughter's coming to IU will mean that we get to see you in person, maybe. Well, she is my granddaughter. My daughter has graduated years <laughs> ago. <laughs> in any case, it's a great occasion. I'm sitting with a beautiful fall color around me, blue sky. We are very delighted and happy folks in this house. Wonderful. Steve Engel. Well, I'm uh, pretty happy because uh, all four of my grandchildren are going to be here for Christmas and they live on either coast, two on the West Coast, two on the East Coast. So it's a big deal for me and I'm just really grateful about it. Happy. Congrats and thanks for your donation to Teachers Warehouse. Anybody else in the room? We've got Steve Moverly in the back. Wait for the mic. I'm very happy because uh, due to the work of uh, 32 people, we have all the slots filled for ringing the bell for the Bloomington Salvation Army. And uh, thank you all to those who have signed up. And thank you, Steve, for your leadership. Anybody else in the room? Yup, Judy Witt. By tomorrow, I should have a new living room ceiling. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds bad. Thanks, Judy. Anybody else on Zoom who's happy? I'm going to jump in here. Yes. Hi, everybody. I just want to say I'm very, I'm very happy not to be teaching today, which means that I'm able to join you. Um, and I'm also very happy to be joining you all the way from New York. I'm here for the week visiting uh, my parents-in-law, and we will all be together for the Thanksgiving break. So just... I'm very, very grateful to everything. And thanks to the amazing team, Michael Shermis and everybody else for making it possible for me to join you. Thanks, Alan. It's great to see you on a Tuesday. I can't wait till this semester's over. <laughs> We've got one more. Is it Ashley? Yes. Alan took mine. Um, I just wanted to give a grateful note to our team that works really hard to make this possible. And Michael, especially, I see him over there working hard. He's off duty, but still on duty. So he's always you. working. Thank you to everyone that makes this, these meetings possible. I know a lot goes uh, behind the scenes. So huge shout out. Yeah. Thank you, Ashley. And we've, we've got a hijack for one more. Yes, absolutely. Wow. I am trying hard. Well, let's see. Would that be Martha Foster? Yeah, that would be Martha Foster and Aaron Davis. Um, and we're very grateful to announce that Thursday is a big holiday, which is our 10th anniversary. Aww. And we appreciate everyone thinking of us Thursday and we'll have family members in from three states. So Aww, congrats. Um, sorry the, yeah, oh, there we sort of are. <laughs> sorry, trying to do it. <laughs> I remember when you all were newlyweds and look at you now, 10 years in. Charlotte has a happy dollar. That's the last one, folks. Charlotte. Charlotte, you're on mute. Ethan, is it okay? Yeah, I've written you a, a note or maybe two notes and probably illegible. But I want to say thank you once again for the wonderful honor that you all accorded me. That was just, and I'm looking forward to, to giving the check to, to participating in the check given to, to Habitat for Humanity. But I think my, the, the toast was such a warm and loving organ thing and so well done by absolutely everybody. I just want to say huge, 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 huge thank you. And I, I will donate twenty dollars, twenty five dollars to the to to the teachers warehouse. Thank you, Charlotte. 
And now, without further ado, Michael Shermis is approaching the podium, whereas he is going to be introducing our speaker. Thank you, Sally. So uh, I'm not like I'm a, a big time world traveler, but uh, I uh, did work for a while where it took me to New York and DC and uh, a couple trips I got to take the high speed rail um, uh, from DC to New York and back. And, uh, you know, I've been in Europe and a couple opportunities there. And I've just always been fascinated by the high-speed rail because it was the most wonderful experience sitting there being able to work on the computer while I'm cruising along and looking up at the beautiful scenery. And I've just always thought, wow, why don't we have this in the rest of America? And so uh, maybe uh, our speaker, William Porter, is going to tell us today. So uh, William Porter has been a member of the High Speed Rail Alliance for about 10 years and on the, uh, on the board of that group for uh, the past two years. He's retired from his career as a public uh, works director in uh, Wauwatosa, Wisconsin and Glenview, Illinois. He received his undergraduate degree from Monmouth College and uh, graduate degrees from Northwestern University. He's married, has three kids, one of whom is a graduate from Butler University. And so, uh, William, if you could unmute, uh, just making sure you can unmute there. Can you hear me now? And, and we're just about ready now to put up your... Um, uh, PowerPoint uh, in just a second here, and you are ready to go and just uh, tell us when you want to advance the slide and, and away you go. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for your assistance in getting on this morning. Uh, as you indicated, uh, we are the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, we are a uh, independent nonprofit based in Chicago, a 501c3 uh, independent uh, organization, and we have three primary goals. One is to act as a clearinghouse for best practices for high-speed rail in America and indeed across the, the world. Secondly, uh, we serve to educate, we want to educate the public about the benefits of high-speed rail through forums such as this and others. And thirdly, we want to provide an active and uh, uh, up-to-date toolbox for in, in, interested individuals who want to contact their uh, state, local, and federal officials about advancing the cause of high-speed rail across the country. Uh, what you're looking at is, the good news is that's a picture of an actual high-speed train traveling at 200 miles an hour, carrying real people to real destinations. Um, the bad news is it's in China and it's not in America. So uh, next slide, please. And can you, you may not want to speak a little bit quieter because it's coming out real loud here. So we're sorry, just a little bit quieter. Okay, let me know if it's too loud. Uh, this is the, uh, this is what you were speaking of earlier, the high speed train in America, which is uh, running from Boston to Washington and New York. It's Amtrak's Excella train. Uh, it's what passes for high speed rail in America. It's the best we can do. At one time in the 60s, it was the past, one of the fastest trains in the world, but now it's really slow by international standards. Uh, and it, um, but it does demonstrate that with fast, reliable, and most importantly, frequent service, uh, Americans will ride the train where it is available. Next slide, please. And there is uh, help on the way, so to speak. The, uh, there is a new equipment being provided that will uh, increase its speed from uh, not 200 miles an hour, but to maybe 160 miles an hour for portions of the trip. Although the bulk of this trip, because of the age of the infrastructure, will still be in the 100 to 120 mile per hour range. Next slide. Uh, reality is, though, actually, America is building high speed rail. It's not generally known. This is a picture of a bridge in California near Fresno. It's actually under construction. We'll talk more about high speed rail in California later in the presentation. Next slide. Uh, state model of Indiana is the crossroads of America. And maybe a little known fact is at one point, Indiana was uh, very active in high-speed rail. Of course, this was high-speed rail back in the 1920s and 1930s. And on the left, you can see all the lines radiating from Indianapolis across central Indiana that were at one time fast, frequent, and electrically powered. 
again, the high speed rail of that era was in the 60 to 70 mile an hour range. But you contrast that with the fact that many of the roads of that era were not paved so that when uh, it rained or snowed, uh, traffic uh, came to a halt or even on the paved roads, uh, you might be going uh, 30 to 40 miles an hour as opposed to 60 or 70 on high speed rail. Of course, with the advent of the tremendous investment in uh, motor vehicle traffic and the depression, all those uh, lines were uh, subsequently abandoned. But when you see a potential future map of high speed rail of Indiana, you'll later in the presentation, uh, it'll look somewhat familiar. Uh, next slide. The reality is uh, Indiana is not known for actively supporting passenger rail, but where it does make sense and where uh, policymakers think there is a return on investment, uh, there is support for passenger rail. This is the new Michigan City station that's under construction right now in Indiana as part of the South Shore Line that runs from Chicago through Michigan City and Gary to South Bend. Uh, and they're actually building a new uh, branch line off of that down from Hammond down to Dyer, Indiana. In total, uh, a $1.4 billion investment in passenger rail, about $450 million of which it constitutes the state share of that project. So where there is a return on investment, uh, Indiana will support passenger rail. And we look at it as our mission to uh, demonstrate high-speed rail can have a, a beneficial impact throughout the rest of the state as well. Next slide. Uh, we built, we actively support high-speed rail for three primary reasons. We think it builds stronger communities. We think face-to-face -face contact has its benefits, although obviously the technology we're using today via Zoom is wonderful that you can't really supplant face-to-face -face contact as this family is doing on a high-speed train in France at about 200 miles an hour. Maybe they're going down to see grandma, maybe they're going to visit a museum in Paris, don't really know, but we think face-to-face -face travel will come back post-pandemic pandemic as it did post polio and post measles and post smallpox. We get past COVID, uh, we think travel will, for business and leisure will blossom once again. And we'd like to see high-speed rail part of that mix. Also, we need to uh, lower our carbon emissions, the transportation sector, planes, trains, automobiles, and let's not forget trucks, make up about one third of all carbon emissions. And so we need to make progress in that sector to reduce our footprint on the climate. And perhaps counterintuitively, we think high-speed rail can serve to reduce overall government spending when looked at in a holistic fashion. Next slide. Travel today on a, is, uh, can be somewhat problematic if on a plane, uh, you're cramped, uh, maybe you get the middle seat like this gentleman here, it's not particularly uh, pleasant. Next slide. Or maybe you're not going to get the middle seat, but the person in front of you is reclining, in which case you're jammed in there like a sardine. I'm 6'5", and when we travel from O'Hare to Salt Lake City, uh, by the time we get there in three hours, I don't know about you, but I'm in pain. I, I need to move around, I need to, be able to stretch my legs and uh, it's not really possible on today's airlines when, unless you're flying first class at a tremendous cost. Next slide. The other option is driving. Some people find driving relaxing. You know, I don't. Uh, a little over a year ago, I was sitting at a stoplight and got T-boned by a driver who lost uh, control. Uh, were it not for airbags, I'd be walking kind of funny today. So I don't really relax when I'm driving. Of course, not all driving is on roads like this, but much of it is, especially in urban areas. Uh, reality is uh, we're on pace for over 42,000 fatalities driving this year, two and a half million people injured. And that's just the, the physical impact. The fiscal impact is you know, all the land under those highways. It's not on the tax rolls. And of course, the carbon footprint. So. Is there another way to travel? Uh, should be part of the mix. Uh, we think there is. The next slide. Uh, this is actually a, a new train car that's going in service on a privately run passenger line that's being that is in operation today from Miami north to West Palm Beach. Uh, you can re you see the seats. You can recline. Plenty of leg room. You can plug in your electronic devices. Big window. Uh, get up, move around when you want. You don't need to wear a seatbelt. Some of the seats have tables, some don't. 
And of course, using Amtrak today, you can even have a private compartment if you want. So there are options to uh, be able to travel in more comfort. And we think high-speed rail in that, uh, you know, four to 600 mile an hour niche can be part of the mix in, in an environmentally responsible manner. Next slide. And of course, as I said, you can move around. This is the TGV in France, uh, uh, the lounge car. People are standing around. They're not hanging out for dear life as you do on some Amtrak trains today. The track has maintained a very rigid standards. Uh, so you can have a drink, go to the lounge car, go to the bathroom when you need to. Of course, there are no guardrails around the food and drinks because it's a very smooth ride and you can relax and enjoy yourself and still get to your destination at over 200 miles an hour. It's, it's doable in today's environment. Next slide. The question we get is, well, how do you make that happen? And we support the, what we call the integrated network approach, whereas you would build possibly a new high-speed rail built to exacting standards in the countryside. But the question we get is, well, how are you gonna get into the cities? Are you gonna hack your way through the cities like we did with the interstate uh, highway system? Uh, we think there's a better way and uh, we'll demonstrate that in a couple of minutes. Next slide. I mentioned that, well, how did the interstate highway system get through the cities? Well, those of us of a certain age might remember a book called The Power Broker. It was published in the 1970s. It won a Pulitzer Prize. And one of the chapters in that book was entitled The Meat Axe. And that was a description an engineer used of how they built the Cross Bronx Freeway through a heavily built up section of the Bronx. And here's a picture of that. And on the one hand, it's a tremendous engineering feat. Think of all the steam, gas, electric, telephone, uh, lines that had to be rerouted. You had to maintain existing highways and overpasses and railroads. You had to go over subway systems that couldn't be disturbed. It was a tremendous accomplishment, but it came at a huge environmental cost. Next slide. This was the finished product. And as you can see, it's more or less a scar on the landscape. Actually, what they did was they took out Tremont Street. This neighborhood was once the home of many of the garment workers in New York. Uh, industry not known for high wages, but the apartment buildings were well maintained. They had superintendents who took care of little things before they became big things. Uh, but they took out the street, they took out the urban fabric, the delicatessen, the, del uh, the tavern, the restaurant, the grocery store, the hardware store, the dry cleaners, all that went away and the neighborhood still suffers today from urban blight as a result of the highway. So are we gonna replicate that story to get high-speed rail into the center of Indianapolis or Chicago? We think there's a better way. Uh, next slide. There are a couple of methods. One is uh, actually uh, railroad mileage in America peaked in 1918. There were 240,000 miles of railways. Now we're down to 140,000 miles. And many of those old right-of-ways have been sold off, paved over, redeveloped, but some are still there. This is actually an abandoned right-of-way in the south side of Chicago that runs down through into, into Indiana. As you can see, the right-of-way is still intact. The bridges and abutments and underpasses are still there. It wouldn't take much to reactivate that with a, a high-speed line and make uh, put that back in service, but, but not gain access to the center city, but not tear down any neighborhoods or buildings in the process. Next slide. And there's some active right-of-ways that could be repurposed. This is the uh, Illinois, old Illinois Central line built in 1926, totally grade separated that runs south of Chicago. And at the time, back in the 1920s, Chicago was a center of Chicago, was a manufacturing and warehousing powerhouse. So there were freight tracks running into downtown where all that, all that, all that freight traffic has disappeared, but the right-of-way is still intact and those freight tracks uh, could be repurposed for high-speed rail, again, without uh, tearing through existing neighborhoods. Next slide. This is how they did it in Italy. This is the Milan to Bologna line, uh, and they built high, new uh, high-speed rail uh, right-of-way in the countryside. And now they can accelerate into the 100, 200, 250 mile an hour range. What they did is they built it alongside the Autostrada or Italy's interstate highway system. And it was all new uh, right of way. They just extended the bridges over the, uh, we're going over the expressway over the uh, railroad right of way. It's electrified because if you, you need to have electric service to go faster than 125 miles an hour, it's fenced. 
and the tracks are built and maintained for high-speed rail. And, the, and the, the freight tracks that were there previously are still in use, but they're, this is totally separate from that. And what you don't see here is that there are actually underpasses underneath the, the high-speed line that allow farmers to access their fields between the interstate and the high-speed line so they still can be, uh, the land is not a dumping ground for a fly dumping or things like that or litter, it's actually still an agricultural production. So it can be done, uh, we think it's, it, but with proper planning it's required to get that moving. Uh, next slide. In terms of carbon emissions, this is a, uh, there's a website in Europe that you can plug in your destinations and it'll give you your carbon footprint expressed per passenger. So with a high-speed train uh, powered by electricity in France, you're looking primarily at nuclear power. So the carbon footprint is very low on a per passenger basis as compared to uh, an airplane, of course, or a, a single passenger car. Of course, electric cars will dramatically impact this, but you're still looking at uh, having a couple tons of metal move one person versus uh, four or 500 people on a train. We still think with electric vehicles, the high-speed rail will come out very favorable in this comparison. Next slide. And of course, uh, in terms of land use, this is a, a kind of a demonstration photo, the Kennedy Expressway in Chicago going out to O'Hare. It just demonstrates the potential for high-speed rail and for passenger trains in general. You took everybody in every car on the outbound lanes of that expressway, they would fit in that train you see in that picture. So you have a tremendous impact on traffic, carbon emissions, land use, and what and, and things like that. That's what high-speed rail can affect uh, moving forward in our in development patterns in America. Next slide. So there's a real world example right now uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, there's a proposal called Cascadia High-Speed Rail to build from uh, a line from uh, Portland to Tacoma, Seattle, and Vancouver. Uh, total costs, land, uh, rolling stock, track, stations, everything, turnkey operation, $42 billion versus a countervailing proposal to add two lanes to existing Interstate 5, one lane in each direction, that costs $110 billion, almost more than twice the cost. Uh, so we talk about government spending in a holistic fashion. Uh, we think high-speed rail can be uh, very favorable in that regard. Next slide. Um, this is uh, what we would envision at High-Speed Rail Alliance for a potential network for Indiana. I would say this is not an official map. This is our map of what we'd like to see. but. Certainly uh, going back to the map I showed previously, an Indian Indianapolis-centric uh, network uh, tied to Chicago, uh, Cincinnati, uh, Detroit, Fort Wayne, uh, the red being high-speed lines, the blue being uh, Amtrak-style service, only much more frequent and at higher speed. So this is something we would like to see in Indiana move forward on uh, in the future. And uh, I mean, I, Everybody's help in making that happen. Next slide. Uh, you got a good place to start. Indianapolis Station uh, was once a center for travel in Indiana. We think it can be again with the uh, uh, as part of a high-speed network. Next slide. How can uh, people use uh, high-speed rail? Well, just let me give you a theoretical example. Let's say I'm a sales accountant for, and I have a regional office in Indianapolis and a, the corporate office is in Chicago and they, maybe they're tired of using Zoom, they want to have a meeting. So maybe you wake up in Indianapolis, uh, have breakfast with your family, uh, get the kids off to school, walk over to the train station or take a bus, take the train in less, a little over an hour to Chicago, have a, have a meeting there in the morning, with your boss and perhaps uh, representatives from across the Midwest, uh, have a leisurely lunch. Uh, you get a lead at the meeting that there's a customer in Lafayette that uh, maybe it's worth calling on. So you come back uh, in the afternoon, stop in Lafayette, uh, meet with him, establish contact, uh, perhaps have a uh, follow-up meeting planned, hop the train back to Indianapolis, walk home, you're back with your family for dinner and get the kids to soccer practice. Theoretical, yes, but those types of interactions are commonplace in Europe today using high-speed rail and could be across the Midwest where we to make the investment. Next slide. 
Uh, this is a Madrid to Seville line, roughly akin to Chicago to Cincinnati with a major city like Indianapolis in the middle. Uh, this is the modal split before high-speed rail, 60% uh, driving, 11% uh, flying after high-speed rail went into service uh, in 1993. Uh, High driving was almost cut in half, flying was cut in half, and the train travel increased almost three and a half times. Think of the effect of that on carbon emissions alone, uh, a tremendous impact, and we think something could be replicated in the Midwest. Next slide. California, as I mentioned earlier, is building high-speed rail. This is the network they're proposing. Right now, they're under construction in the Central Valley from just south of Merced to just north of Bakersfield. People deride that as a boondoggle and a waste of money. They're saying you're building a train to nowhere. Well, it's part of a network. And as the network is, uh, Central Valley is a valley. It's flat and it's straight. And you can build a large amount of rail there for a relatively inexpensive cost, as opposed to building across the mountains that are existing from Bakersfield into LA and from Merced over to San Jose. Those lines are under design right now, but uh, and trying to get environmental clearances, but uh, the line that's actually under construction is the Central Valley. And also I should mention the Brown Line from Las Vegas down to Victorville and Palmdale is being contemplated by a private uh, in company, the same one that built the line in Florida. And they're gonna build in the, inter in the median strip of Interstate 15. And they're, right now they're negotiating to get into the LA Basin across the Cajon Pass from Victorville to downtown LA. So that they're hoping to start construction there in, uh, 19, in 2022. Next slide. So when that line in the Central Valley goes into service, what will happen is that the existing Amtrak trains, which are six pre-COVID, will go to 18 trains a day. And those thin green lines are connecting buses that uh, have through ticketing and cross-platform transfers. Those will go to 18 a day. And so you actually have the beginnings of a real statewide network that ultimately when the full line is built from San Francisco uh, to LA will provide high-speed rail for uh, the bulk of the state. Next slide. And what that does in terms of uh, boosting volume uh, with the high-speed rail, ridership will double. Uh, the revenue derived from that ridership will more than double because it's a better service. You can charge a little bit more. And then what happens is the net cost of operating that system, even though you're running more trains and providing more service, carrying more people, the net cost or subsidy from the state of California to operate that service actually goes down. And we think that, that uh, type of... Uh, a revenue stream can uh, be uh, put in place in other uh, other lines across uh, the country and especially in the Midwest. Next slide. So in terms of a Midwest network, this is what we would see again uh, as part of the Midwest network with uh, uh, lines centering obviously in Chicago, but radiate, radiating out in all directions and then a, a, a good linkage to O'Hare, which links uh, Midwest to the global economy worldwide. I, I look at this not only in terms of connecting Minneapolis and Cincinnati and Indianapolis to Chicago and Detroit and all that, but think about it in terms of business and leisure travel, also uh, educational universities and travel within the region. I call it, sometimes I call it the Big Ten map, if you think about where the Big Ten universities are, obviously one's in Bloomington, West Lafayette, Ann Arbor, Lansing, Columbus, Champaign, Evanston, Madison, Iowa City, Lincoln, Nebraska. Linking all those universities as part of that network, but not only with each other, but with Chicago and with O'Hare, just in that aspect alone, uh, not to mention business and leisure travel, would have a tremendous impact you know, on the region and we think would be worthwhile of an extensive investment. Next slide. So how do we make it happen? Uh, we, would, we would certainly advocate for a high-speed rail commission in Indiana to study this and plan for this in the future. Uh, Illinois just established a high-speed rail commission. There's a template there that Indiana could build on. Uh, right now, the state rail plan for Indiana is being reviewed. It's high-speed rail is not part of that rail plan. We think it should be. Uh, and then I think that commission should work to put together a uh, integrated plan, as I spoke of earlier, for not only Indiana, but for the Midwest. 
so that uh, pieces of it can be go into effect over time. Uh, and but you have a comprehensive network that you're working towards for the future. And then the centerpiece, and this is not only just for Illinois, but we think for the region is to bring high-speed rail to O'Hare Airport. I go back to a story that our executive director talks about. He was giving a presentation at Purdue recently, and he asked, well, how do you see high, what do you see the benefits of high-speed rail for Purdue University? And they spoke up very clearly, get us to O'Hare. We want those Chinese students from, from Japan and the Far East who are paying full freight uh, be, to be able to get to West Lafayette in under two hours uh, by train. And uh, we think a high-speed rail network, like I showed previously, could make that happen. Next slide. And we think it obviously needs a federal authorization, uh, federal funds to jumpstart the program. This slide's a little bit dated. The infrastructure bill did pass, and there is money in there for uh, high-speed rail. Uh, but the uh, Build Back Better plan of reconciliation bill at this point, funding, I mean, uh, passage is nowhere near certain, but right now it does contain 10 billion over five years, for five years uh, dedicated towards high-speed rail. We'd certainly advocate for that. and like to see that move forward. Next slide. So in summary, I know I've covered a lot of ground quickly. I'd be happy to answer questions, but if you'd like to learn more, that's our website. That's our phone number. And we can uh, give us a call. We can certainly talk more uh, and certainly go on our website. You can sign up for a newsletter, no financial obligation. This keeps you informed as things occur. And uh, we'd love to uh, speak to you more. And I'd be happy to take any questions if time allows. William, thank you so much for that incredible presentation and depth of information. We have questions here in the Frangie Panny or on Zoom. Um, Owen has a question. M Martha and Aaron are on their way. Do we have a question on Zoom prior? Not. No. Oh. Owen, go for it. Um, I'm gonna. I, I've ridden high speed rail. I went from Osaka to Tokyo, so I uh, have experience uh, with the benefits, um, but I want to play devil's advocate. There are two groups very vocal that I would see opposing what you do, not in the detail, but they would just say the airlines are going to lose all of these jobs and people are going to be out of work. So that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, railroads in the late 19th and early 20th century they determined which towns would live and die. The system that you're talking about hits the larger cities, but the small towns, um, Cary, Illinois, Spencer, Indiana, they're not going to get this. And yet they're going to say, we have to pay for this. Well, in terms of airlines, um, you know, I, I my previous career as a public works director, I, mean, I, went to a, I went to a seminar once and I talked about uh, one of the seminar sessions was on air, airport management and airlines economics. And they said that the two things you worry about with an airline are terminal space and landing slots. And the runway doesn't care if the plane is landing from Frankfurt, Germany or Osaka, Japan or Indianapolis or Cincinnati or Milwaukee or, Chicago, or uh, Detroit. And so what's actually happening in Europe these days in terms of carbon emissions is that in areas where there are high-speed rail trains within the country, say from Berlin to Munich or Berlin to Hamburg, they're actually truncating the, eliminating the air traffic between those cities and concentrating on high-speed rail, not only for carbon emissions, but because they wanna free up those landing slots and that terminal space for the, for the traffic that's coming from overseas. This is a global economy, it will rebound someday. And so those connections at O'Hare across the, the world, uh, you know, will be enhanced by freeing up landing slots and not having to build expensive new runways and expensive new terminal space. We can reutilize uh, those, uh, that, that capacity for international travel versus travel within the Midwest. In terms of uh, connections to uh, high-speed rail and bypassing certain cities, I mean, yes, that's unavoidable. 
Uh, what uh, we think there should be is California is doing a robust uh, bus network that would tie in certain cities like uh, Muncie to Indianapolis or uh, we'd see rail service to Bloomington or uh, Greenberg or uh, Elkhart or Fort Wayne or other cities that would tie in to a high-speed rail network located in Indianapolis or in Fort Wayne or in Louisville or things like that. So I guess there are always winners and losers, but the fact is the train does go through many of these communities and with proper infrastructure can have both express trains that may run nonstop, say Chicago to Indianapolis, but could have local service that makes the stop in Rensselaer and Lafayette uh, and, uh, and Hammond and, and along the way to link people in uh, to an overall network. So I would agree that there are winners and losers in every uh, infrastructure investment, but there are ways to mitigate it, we think, with high-speed rail. Obviously, if you're on a plane, you're not stopping in Rensselaer or Lafayette. You're going from uh, Cincinnati, Chicago, or Indianapolis to Chicago. You're not making that connection. You don't have that option. Thank you. Charlotte Zitlow, you have a question on Zoom. Please unmute. We think Charlotte hit the wrong button. Um, any other questions? If not, thank you, William, again, for being, first of all, our first ever virtual speaker in our hybrid meeting um, experience. And um, thank you again for, for spending the time with us and for the work that you're doing. Well, thank you very much for having us. We do appreciate the opportunity. Best, uh, best of luck for a holiday, good holiday season. And to you. Thank you. Uh, in, in recognition of your talk to our club today, we'll make a donation to Wonder Lab, which is our community children's science museum. Very honored, thank you. But next week, our speaker is Stephanie von Hirschberg from the Citizen Climate Club. So let's close our meeting by reciting the four-way test plus one together. Of the things we think, say, or do, first, second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And fifth, is it fun? Thank you, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, bye-bye.